we're uh, moving through. Moving through John. I'm going to pick up verse 20. And it goes to verse 26. In the last few weeks, we've, we've been looking at John 17, which is the prayer of the Lord Jesus as he, uh, as he prays to the Father in reference to Himself. And we, we've seen that in verse 1 through 5. 6 through 19, we've seen where the Lord Jesus was praying to the Father in, in reference to the disciples. His chosen ones, his, his the ones that He would place around Himself, for a purpose, and His praying for them, His care of them. And then it picked up about verse 20 where we'll look at this morning to 26. He, he references verse 20. He says, I'm not praying not only, am I not praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Now he's praying for the future believers. 20 to 26. I'm praying not only for these disciples, those that are around me, those that have been with me for the last three years or so, those who I've kept close to me. I'm not only praying for them, but I'm also praying for all those who would believe in me through their message through what these disciples have to say. I'm praying for those future believers too. I pray for them. If anyone knew, the Lord Jesus knew and understood, of course, the warfare behind the scenes. That which you and I we only see the physical aspect of it. We don't see the, the invisible aspect of it, what goes on behind the scenes, the, the demonic aspect, the, the holy angel aspect, if you will, you know, the, the, the battles, the struggles for the souls of human beings. And as Satan himself sends out his demons to wreak havoc, in the lives of believers and wreak havoc in the lives of unbelievers, wreak havoc in this world in which we live. So Christ says, I'm not only praying for these disciples, those that I've been chosen, those I've chosen, but also praying for those that will hear the message of these disciples, that will believe in the message. They will be chosen ones also. I pray for them too. The future believers. I pray for them. I pray for their spiritual well-being, is what he's saying. I pray for their spiritual well-being. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world will be believe that you sent me. It says, I pray that they believe as one. And wow, we, I mean... The differences today in, uh, I, I put the word Christian in quotations because the differences today in beliefs and understandings and it's, it's, it's so vast. It's so vast. It doesn't take long. You drive down the road two minutes and you'll bump into a church. You drive down the road two minutes to my right, your left, and you'll bump into a church. And... There's differences there. There's different understandings. And Justin said it before, and the interesting thing is we all think we've got it right. We all think we've figured it out. And we all think that we've got it right and everybody else has it wrong. And 
But the truth is, you've got the Word of God in front of you. And for a lot of it, you can get it right. You can believe as one. You can believe as one and get it right and understand that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Redeemer of the world. Salvation only comes through Him. Repentance is part of salvation. To turn away from this life and turn on, on turn onto Christ and to turn away from the world and turn to Him, serve Him and worship Him. To live a sanctified life, to be set apart unto Christ. Jesus is saying, I pray that they all believe as one. I pray, I pray that they all believe in this. In me, those things I just said, just as he and the Father are, are one. You know, even though he's the second member of the Godhead, even though he foreordained everything that would ever happen before time began, even though he knows the end and the beginning, what's he doing? He still prays. Yeah. He's praying for those whom he knew. That he, that the Father chose, that he knew he was coming to redeem those specific people, and he's praying for them. Yeah. It, there are people who say, well, if you believe the, in the sovereignty of God, then there's no reason to pray. Well, the response to that is that's the only reason to pray. Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen, and he's praying to the Father. There is no excuse to not pray. He is praying because he knows what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Not because he doesn't know. Yeah. And there's no excuse, just like you said, not to pray. There's no excuse not to tell somebody about Christ. There's no excuse not to evangelize. I mean, there's no excuse. We know that he's sovereign. We know that exactly right, that every aspect... In, in your life falls under his control, but there's still, and he's going to do what he's going to do, but we're still called to what? To pray, and here's the greatest, you're exactly right, Justin, here's the greatest example of that, the Son of God doing just that. Doing just that. Praying for those who would come to faith, that they would be one, that they would operate as one unit. That they would operate as one unit, not for self, but for the Father. But to see that the Father is glorified. That they would operate as one unit. That they would move about as one. So that they may be one just as we are one. There's a very difficult problem in leading a group of people when, and it's, they're not being led as one. If you want to take it on that note. You've got a few that want to do their own thing. Or, are you saying this so that they may be one as, as we are one? And that mindset, as you're, you're just so right, is, is found its way into the church. It's found its way into the church to such a degree. And Paul fought again. Fought, it's nothing new, you know, as, as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. And, and, but Paul fought against this a lot. 
especially within the church. And you see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where you've got those that, you know, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulus, or whatever, I'm of Jesus. And, and it was just this thrust to elevate man. There was this thrust to, to lift man up and let it become, a, let it become a, a show of Apollos or let it become a show of Paul. And, and, but it's none of that. It has nothing to do with that. It's not to elevate man. It's not to glory man. It's to what? It's to come together for what? For, for one purpose, one goal, and that's to glorify Christ, to lift up Christ. And everything else, because we're, we're really, I mean, just hanging on by, if you will, the hem of his garment. Have you, have you heard that said before? You know, that's all we are. We're really nothing. I don't, you know, we don't have no type of, you know, any anything special. There's nothing anything special from the pastor or preacher that comes from behind behind the pulpit. He has no nothing special to him. He's just placed in a position and given a, a gift and whatever it may be in in the church, but it's all for the glory of Christ. There's no special authority given to anybody, really. I mean, the authority all comes from Christ, and that's what Christ, that's what Paul was saying about Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, is let us operate as one unit. Let us operate as one for the glory of Christ. There's really nothing in us. Nothing fabulous about us. Yes, some might speak better than others. Some might be more eloquent than others when it comes to speaking, if you will. But, I mean, my goodness gracious, we've talked about this in the past in Corinthians the greatest evangelist of all time is is Paul, probably, and I mean, my gracious, you, you know, some said his his speech was what he was detestable to look upon, and his speech was horrendous. There was nothing fabulous to the guy, but that doesn't matter because it's Christ that gave the increase. It's Christ that has turned the world upside down, if you will, through certain individuals. But they learn to operate so that they may be as one as we are one. So they learn to operate as one for the glory of Christ. I and them and you are in me. You see, there it is. I'm in them and you are in me. Outside of Christ, we are nothing. Outside of Christ, we are incapable of doing anything. Nothing in us given a gift, talent. There's two complete different things. We twist them all to pieces and call a gift a talent a talent and gift. They're two complete different things, but that's a side note, but they both come from Christ for His glory. And just as Jesus is praying for His disciples here, here He's praying for the future believers. He said, I've given them glory I've given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I'm in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Now he's talking about perfect unity in them, in the Father and the Son and to the believers. He speaks of the perfect unity. We as believers, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that, that fills us and, and our perfect unity is in Him. We've been blessed tremendously. We've been given a person of the Holy Spirit to so fill us, to assure our hearts, to assure our hearts who we are, to assure our hearts that we have unity in Christ. To assure our hearts that, that it's nothing to do with us, but it's, it's Christ giving the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit to us, to assure our hearts, to lead us, to guide us, to direct us. In and of ourselves, we have never loved Christ. Until what? Until He first loved us and gave us the ability to love Him. They experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Now listen to this statement. He says, may they know. 
that you love them as much as you love me. May they know this. Think about that. Again, in verse 23, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. The love from the Father to you, he says, may they know that you love them as much as you love me. And the Father has a love for his Son that we cannot even comprehend. So that means he has a love for us that we cannot even comprehend. Think about that. Talk about assurance to the heart of a, hu of a human being who was once in, in, in sins and trespasses, who was one dead, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 5. Talk about, talk about assurance. What an amazing, what an amazing statement to say from the Lord Jesus Himself. Well, it's because the love of the Father is dependent upon the Son. Yeah. The Father loved us, chose us, sent the Son to live in our place and to die in our place. The Father has that love for his children. Yeah. Because he has united them to his son. When he sees me, he don't see me and my crappy works. He sees his son and his perfect works. That's why he loves me with a love that is the same as his love for his son. Because he sees his son. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that, I mean, with, especially within the church, people don't see themselves as as being loved at that level, they see themselves as, as having to drum up some love from the Father. Well, everybody's a natural legalist. We think we got to perform. We got to perform to a certain level for God to love us. That's what people think. Yeah. I mean, I think Gentry back here. Does Gentry have to perform to a certain level for me to love him? What do you think? No. I love him regardless. He's my son. He doesn't have to earn the last name Boss. And, and it's me as evil as I am, if he doesn't have to earn my love, if he doesn't, doesn't have to earn my last name, my goodness. God, who loves us with a perfect love, a sinless love, we certainly don't have to earn his love because he has bestowed upon us and showed us every bit of that in what his son went through and what he's done to his son on our behalf. Yep. Yep. But we think God is, is less loving than a sinful earthly father. And here, the Lord Jesus crushes our understanding and says what? That they will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. You love them because of what? Just like you said, that I reside in them. As I said just a few minutes ago, you talk about amazing love. You talk about the assurance to a believer to understand, to grasp the fact that he loves us. The Father loves us at a, at a level that absolutely nothing we experience or go through in life, he never leaves us alone. Never leaves us alone. He's always present with us. Why? It's because of what we've done? No. It's because of what Christ has done for us.
And in this amazing love, He bestows upon us His Spirit to give us rest, peace in our hearts, to remind us of His amazing grace, His amazing love. Father, I want these whom you've given me to be with me where what? Where I am. I want these whom you've given me. There it is again. All that the Father gives me, right? All that the Father gives me. I will no way turn them. I will no way. I will no, absolutely no chance of me turning them away. I want these whom you've given me to be where I am. Why? Why? Why that? Why does he want that? Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. One of the things about heaven is right here. In John 17 verse 24. When you die this physical die in this physical life, when you leave this physical life, however it may be, or if the Lord raptures you home, you will be, you will witness the glory unlike anything you have or could have ever imagined. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. This will be in heaven where we will see a full display of the glory of Christ. We'll see a full display of his glory. Where Christ is, we will be. It's an amazing thought. Even before the world began, this plan was put into action put into place even before the world began it was put into place that someday how many years down the road you would be born physically Your mother and father would come together. You would be conceived, born, live a life, come to faith in the amazing Son of God because of what He has done, not because of what you have done, but because He has arranged this to happen. Given the Holy Spirit to reside in you. To lead you, to guide you, to direct you. To be loved by the Father like the Father loves the Son. <coughs> and then for the plan. For you to see all the glory. For you to experience all the glory. Unlike anything 
that you've ever experienced. Oh, righteous Father, <coughs> the world does not know you, but I do. These disciples know you sent me. I revealed you to them. I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. Listen what he says. The world doesn't know you, but I do. We've said this before. <clears throat> the world doesn't understand. The world doesn't know. I was watching Vern Hall as they were handing out evangelism tracks at, at the... Uh, whatever that thing was, rainbow something going on in Johnson City. But and one of the responses to him from some guy walking by with his kids and was, don't even think about it. Like, don't even think about giving me that track, you know, whatever. Something stupid like that. The world doesn't know. It don't know. All those people there don't know. Most of them don't know. And that's what the sad thing about it is. That there was somebody standing there handing out tracts that speak of eternal life. That speak of eternal life to speak of the only way to eternal life. And the world is so blind, so unknowing that the response from most of those people was don't even think about it. I'm not interested. I can care less. Leave me alone. It makes me think of the very last verse of John. And it, you know, God had pity on us. We were as helpless as those people at the gay pride event. The very last verse of John. So should I not have pity on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. Mm -hmm. Those people don't know the difference in their right and left hand. Romans 1, they've suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. Yeah. yeah. God has pity on some and he gives justice to others. In no way is he unjust. Yeah. He has shown pity to us who were no different. Yeah. And those people are rebelling according to their nature. Yeah. They're just more honest about it. There are many who sit in pews every Sunday and they hate God every bit as much as those people at that gay pride event. But at least those people are a little more honest about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, said, I've probably said this a thousand times. I've sat in Sunday school classes when people say, well, I never hated God. No. You're either deceived or you're lying. Because every one of us was an enemy of God. Yeah. yeah. At one time. Nobody was saved coming out of the womb. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you're exactly right. I was this past week I was talking to an older lady and about the Lord and she said, you know, dude, she said, I'm such a good person and and you 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 talk to people and I've come to learn and what Justin's saying is, is so true that just because somebody speaks of church or speaks of Christ doesn't really mean anything you really don't know the person's heart and you know we were after we met here yesterday for the ambassador mm -hmm. evangelism we went over to the the riverfront park they were having like a craft fair and the boys handed out some books and I was going to handing out some tracks and talking to people and, you know you can talk to people 
people, you get to do some of them are trusted in Christ. And then you get, there were some ladies there, I figured they were Muslims, they had the, the, the head thing on. And, you know, I gave them a track, and, you know, this tells you about Jesus and how he said, oh, they're, they're quick to jump on it and say, oh, we believe in Jesus. We believe Jesus is the Messiah. I'm like, yeah, but you don't believe he's God. And if you don't believe he's God, you'll go to hell. Another lady, she said, well, I'll give this to uh, my pastor, Apostle Jennifer. <laughs> I'm like, those people have a Jesus. Yeah. But they don't have the Jesus of Scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you're, you're so right because the more you talk to people... At least this is in my own experience. I, I, I say it all the time. I see so many different people and never met before. And probably never meet them again, some of them, most of them. And the more you talk to people, the more you see that just because there's a cross hanging on the wall in the house or there's a tag or a fish on the back of the tailgate or whatever, it, it, it doesn't really mean anything. They have a form of godliness. They have a form of belief. A lot of them. But they're not of the group that Jesus is talking about here in verse 20 to 26. I'm praying for all those who would believe one day. All those future believers who would believe is who I'm praying for. And down in verse 26, I've revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. You see, there's in verse 26 exactly what was just mentioned 10 minutes ago. If the Father only loves us because what? Because the Son resides in us. He resides in us and what the Son has done. Not for what we've done. For we are an absolute spiritual train wreck outside of Christ who is the Son of the living God. Amen. Anybody else have anything? All right. We'll take a few minutes, okay?